Hello guys, my name is Dr. Khalid Zalme and today I'm going to be debunking some of the common vaccine myths that I see online. But first of all, let's just say a big thank you to our main sponsor today, Pfizer. That's a joke. Don't take that seriously. They did pay me in blue pills. Thank you. So the commonest one I see is the vaccine gives you COVID and that's just not true. If we are looking at this kind of vaccine, it's an mRNA vaccine, so it doesn't have any COVID virus in the vaccine. I think the misconception comes from other types of vaccines in the past where people kind of get a bit confused about it. So you've got inactivated vaccines where you've got inactive forms of a virus or bacteria, or you've got live attenuated vaccines where you've got a weakened version of a virus in there. And people think, oh, well, that, that might give you the virus, but that's not how it works. Normally these give your immune system an ability to fight it off. The COVID vaccine is none of these, so it doesn't contain the COVID virus. Sometimes people, after they have a vaccine, they may get a bit of a temperature or they may feel a little bit run down and they think, well, I had a flu vaccine and it's given me the flu. It's not the case. It's actually your immune reaction, which you're experiencing. And that's something we want because we want your body to be ready for the actual virus when it comes into contact with it. I want to indulge on this one. I want you to come on a crazy rabbit hole journey with me. It would have to be stable in liquid form. It would have to be super, super small, probably thousands of times smaller than the smallest microchip we have, and also some sort of transmission ability to be able to send it off to the lizard people. Yes, the lizard people. Well, I'll come to that a bit later. So then you, you post this on Facebook using your phone, which also has a microchip. Wouldn't it just be easier if they put it on the phone? I mean, you, you wake up in the morning and the first thing you do is you pick up your phone and you use it throughout the day, you carry it around with you, you pay for everything you pay nowadays with your phone, it tracks everywhere you go. Kind of sounds like it's a lot simpler if they just used your phone. It's a lot more cost effective as well, I've got to tell you that. And second of all, why would they need to put the microchips in your body? Like, do they need to know your bowel motions? Do they need to know how often you go for a dump? Probably not, they probably don't give a shit. Pun not intended. Me as your doctor, I, I don't care how often you go for a dump, unless it's too much or too little. If it's in this green zone, then we just don't need to talk about it. Probably exhausted that avenue. Myth debunked. It doesn't change your genetics. In fact, if it were to change your genetics, it would need to go into the nucleus of the cell, the central part of the cell that contains your genetic material, your DNA. This works on the ribosomes, a factory making part of the cell, so it doesn't even go into the nucleus. Therefore, it cannot change your genetics. I've done another video about how this vaccine works, and if you wanted to have a look at it, I'll link the description. I'll link the link below. I'll put the link in the description for you to see. The bottom line is it doesn't do anything with your genetics. Don't worry about it. Cool, he said. You're not gonna turn into a lizard. That's the end of that. So some people argue that this vaccine was rushed, therefore it cannot be safe. In some ways, I could un understand their concerns. Um, it is unprecedented that a vaccine gets the go ahead within eight, nine months of it being launched. But at the same time, we're in a global pandemic that's been basically unheard of in modern times. The world is in some ways in a standstill. So scientists have been working round the clock to try and find answers. And there's been a lot of collaboration as well across different countries, uh, different scientists and different organizations. So I think it's incredible what they've done, but the process has still been rigorous. The process that is in terms of creating a vaccine, the different stages, they've still gone through all of those stages successfully. They've shown there are no concerning, you know, um, harmful side effects. There are minor side effects that we get with any other type of vaccine. So importantly, I think they've proven that it is safe. For those skeptical of how can they come up with something so quick? Well, the mRNA vaccine technology, that's been the research behind it has been going on for decades. And the recent SARS and MERS um, epidemics showed that we were looking more at spike proteins. So all of this is kind of been in going on in the background anyway. It's just that now we've been able to bring everything together. For most vaccines, we see the side effects within weeks to months in terms of what could go wrong. And what we've seen with this vaccine is very minimal. If anything, people can get some aches, a bit of lethargy, uh, temperature, all the kind of things we would see with other vaccines. Some people are really concerned about 
Well, what are the long-term side effects? My question would be, what are the long-term side effects of COVID? We know that people who get COVID are more prone to blood clots, scarring on their lungs, and multiple other comorbidities. The risk is proven with COVID. So if we do nothing, we already are doing some harm. It's almost like a scale. You look at the good and the bad. And in this case, when I look at the research in terms of this vaccine, I see more good things than bad things. Yes, we need to know whether people keep long-term immunity once they're immunized. And yes, we need to know if there are any significant uh, long-term side effects. With other vaccines, this is very, very rare, so I wouldn't expect it. Why is there no vaccine for cancer? So the truth is, cancer is a super complex disease. It's not like a virus that gets in your body and you can identify what it looks like and find a way of defeating it. Cancer has got lots of different risk factors from obesity to alcohol, smoking, family history, and all different types of cancers in your body have different risk factors. So I think it's too simplistic to just throw out a concept that if you've made a vaccine for this, why can't you do it for that? They've all got their own different pathophysiology and different ways that they grow. Simply put, it's not that easy. You can't just make a vaccine for everything. There are some cancers that a virus has been found to be a significant risk factor, like cervical cancer, where the HPV virus was found to be a risk factor. We've now developed vaccines for that, and we've significantly reduced people having cervical cancer after they've had the vaccine. So if anything, we've shown that we can do that when it is a cancer that is caused by a virus. I see this a lot with a lot of young people who just say, well, I'm not bothered. Why do I need to get a vaccine if this virus only kills 1% of people? We have to think about not just you as an individual, but as us as a collective, your community. With the virus, it's got the potential for exponential growth. And as humans, we sometimes, we find that concept quite difficult to grasp. So we have to think of the vulnerable in society and we have to be doing it for ourselves and others. Also, when you have immunity, it means you're less likely to transmit it still making sure you follow protection rules, so making sure you wash your hands, you wear a mask and you keep a distance. But generally speaking, if you're immune, you are generally less likely to spread it. So that's another important factor to hit on. Some people aren't happy that it's not 100% effective, so they're like, what's the point? Well, if we look at the seasonal flu vaccine that we give every year to elderly patients and patients with comorbidities, that vaccine is actually sometimes 50, 60% maybe effective if that. But what it does is it still saves hundreds of thousands of lives and it is still protecting those people. So I think the idea that you want something to be 100% protective before you take it is a little bit flawed. Let's do a little bit of just quick maths. 0% and 90%. That's if you don't get the vaccine. That's if you do. This is another one that often comes up and it's about fertility. The vaccine we know is an mRNA vaccine. We look at how the vaccine works. We know it doesn't change your genetics, which we talked about earlier. Theoretically, it shouldn't affect your fertility. If we look at the science, there was a study that came out in October that had a look at men who had recently had COVID and they followed them up and they did sperm counts. 50% of these people had something called oligospermia, which basically means low sperm counts. So if we're really worried about fertility, we know that COVID virus has significant health problems it can give to people, but also there is some evidence that it could affect fertility. The study obviously needs to be reproduced with a larger sample size, and it needs to be done again in different countries to show the same effect. So it's weighing up a post that Karen does on a Facebook group versus science and researchers. It's a tough choice sometimes. So that's been some myth debunking. If you enjoyed that, then it would be jolly good if you could hit the bell with a ding ding thing. And if you want me to do some more debunking or if you have some questions about the vaccine, drop them in the comments below. I will see you on the next video. Peace out.